Just now, the host has very kindly talked about many of my experiences, uh, which makes me feel humble. I feel that uh, as a listed uh, company in Hong Kong, and also uh, as, a, um, as a Chinese uh, uh, company, we like to talk about the environmental uh, industry uh, because uh, our company, uh, Everbright, you know, as a Chinese company and a Hong Kong listed company, we only have two to three years of experience of going abroad. So that story is not. Therefore, I would like to share a bit broader of a vision with you, a bit broader scope. So today, I like to share about four different areas. The first is to share with you some of my thoughts about the 19th uh, CPC National Congress, uh, meaning uh, the opening of a new era for China. And secondly, I also like to talk about uh, the new normal that China's development has moved into. And thirdly, I'd like to talk about Belt and Road and certain new opportunities that one might expect. And the fourth point is Hong Kong's future. I believe uh, you have a lot of expectations about this. Now, regarding the 19th CPC National Congress, uh, it was convened uh, in October uh, in Beijing, and it ca it caught the world's experience, uh, um, the world's attention, and the scope is broad. If you have to understand China, the prospects and the opportunities, and what would its impact be to the world, including that to the to Hong Kong, you must fully. Uh, and to begin with the understanding of the uh, 19th CPC report, that is um, a 30,000 word report, which uh, Ch Chairman C took three and a half hours to read through it. Uh, it is of great bro uh, breadth and depth, uh, which is something not, uh, not possible for me to cover within the matter of um, an hour or so. So main thoughts. One main thought and one dream of the 19th CPC. And I saw like the two centuries and two steps, four greats and four confidences, as well as five progresses and six tasks. Now, simply put, what does that mean? One thought, meaning the new uh, Xi Jinping thought on socialization with Chinese characteristics for a new era. And that is to realize the great dream of Chinese rejuvenation. So in the next decades or so, one might say that for China, this would be the guiding thought for the nation, for the people, to realize this great dream. Now as to two centuries and two stages, now this is a Chinese concept. This is from uh, twen uh, 1921 to 2021, as you know, this is the first century of the establishment of the Chinese uh, Communist Party. And the next one is 1949 to 2049, and that goes to represent the establishment of New China, the first, de uh, the first century. The two stages is 2020 to 2035. And then 2030 to 2050, that would be the two stages where there are important goals for China. By 2030, uh, China has to basically be more modernized. Uh, that means that they will take another 15 years to complete that. And also, uh, to the middle of, the, of this century, um, China aims to become a strong, big country uh, using socialist modernization. Therefore, uh, these two periods are the strategic, uh, these two stages are the uh, strategy for China. Four greats and four confidences would be great struggle, great project, great cause, and great dream. Um, the so called great struggle is not about the past, is it about the many, many challenges and obstacles? that we would face in the new era. The so-called great project would be the building of the party, the Chinese Communist Party, anti-corruption, and the, and the four confidences would be the confidence in path, in theory, in system, 
and in culture. Now as to the civilization, one might say that this is uh, a cultural material as well as the one that we're pursuing now, the ecological progress. Now if we look at a historic uh, perspective, one might say that uh, human civilization starts from agricultural to industrial and to today's ecological progress. So be it uh, in depth and in breadth, in time or in uh, geographic uh, con uh, per uh, scope, we are seeing a convergent trend. It talks about how human uh, works with uh, our environment in a harmonious way and to continue to develop. Now, after the 19th CPC, China is moving into a new age, and China's development is going into a new normal. This new normal can encompass many different aspects of the society development. I'd like to touch on some uh, very uh, key, key points. Uh, one is about the moderate growth, real economic activity, and the third one is about state-owned enterprises. Fourthly, about ecological progress, and also fifth, Belt and Road, of course. You know, these are the many different aspects of the new uh, normal for China. Now, regarding the, uh, we're talking about the uh, past three decades. Uh, you know, high growth, double-digit growth for China. And that had raised China to become the world's second largest economy by nominal GDP. And its um, GDP nominal reaches exceeding 11.8 uh, trillion. And the per capita G GDP exceeds 8,400. This is huge achievement, and yet it comes with huge cost. Uh, at the expense of the environment. As you can see, pop, uh, pollution is uh, very severe, especially air pollution. Uh, Chinese people's health is uh, being, you know, facing hazardous um, challenges. Uh, the occurrence of uh, various types of humor uh, is now in the range of 30%, 40%, or even 50%. So it requires great management and stringent efforts to correct this. As you can see, double-digit growth has become a history. It is no longer possible these days. And we are looking at single-digit growth, which is uh, 5 to 7 percent per year. So this is the effort that we need to put in place to try our best to maintain a growth not less than 5%. This is hugely important because by 2035, if China has to be basically modernized and to, by 2050 become a strong socialist country in the world, uh, if this is the target, then without a uh, reasonable speed, it is not achievable. Now, if we look at 2035, uh, one might expect a double, you know, a trip, a doubling of the GDP. By 2050, to be a strong um, uh, country, socialist country, your per capita GDP should not be low. Any speed or any growth, economic growth slower than 5% is not feasible. This is hugely important for China. And secondly, it has to realize quality growth, meaning it has to be sustainable. It has to be environmentally friendly, and it has to be sustainable. Now, once you know these development targets has been reached, we all know that what would China feel like? What would it, what would its impact be to the world? As you may see, uh, Chinese people takes uh, ninety percent of total population. If that becomes a highly developing um, society, meaning. That would mean that the poverty ratio would be reduced by 19 percent, and the uh, high, you know, developed uh, population would increase by 19 percent. Now, with a with a um, population um, strategy, um, it means that the Chinese population may well exceed 20 percent by then. So, it is hugely meaningful to the uh, development of uh, the world. Now, secondly, I like to talk about the uh, real econ economic activity. Now, to be a strong nation, China must work on its real economic activity. It must be uh, realistically um, innovative, and you know, we. I believe Hong Kong's 
success as well as the challenges that it faced is also in this arena. Whether Hong Kong can become better and better really depends on whether Hong Kong can find the crux and the um, the key to innovation and to enhancement of real econ economy. Now, with real economy, there are three things that one needs to uh, manage well. One is its uh, relationship with the financial economy, its environment, as well as in with innovation. Now, these relationship, Mr. C, you know, has actually in um, um, in a global um, meeting has clearly stated that. Finance is the vein, the vessels of um, of the global economy. This is the starting point, and the ending point, the very important platform of growing this economy. This is so very clear. And secondly, we are talking about real economy versus environment. We are saying that. Uh, real economy, there are good aspects as well as bad aspects. The environmental pollution that we see today, you know, is not created by finance. It is created by uh, real industries such as uh, mining, cement, uh, etc. So we need to develop environmental friendly, uh, energy efficient uh, industries. We must abolish those that does not follow this line. And the third relationships between real economy and innovation. We are saying that uh, you know, since finance is the vein and the vascular system of uh, of the economy, then what would be the skeleton? What would be the structure? Of course, it would be innovation. So with innovation and finance, you know, one can expect a person to stand. So. Uh, skeleton must be strong, and your veins, your vascular system must be uh, th uh, must be smooth and must be without obstacles. So these are the two areas. So when we talk about innovation in China, there are two areas. One is the uh, mass innovation, and another one is technology innovation. Now, because of time constraint, I probably cannot expand into this. Now, why is it this is being um, promoted in China? Uh, it does not ask um, everybody in China to be innovative and to be an entrepreneur, whereas the focus is to emphasize innovation and entrepreneurship is so very important to China. The government encourage everybody to do that. It is a right for everyone. However, we know that this is uh, not easy. Uh, you have this right does not mean that you have the ability so to grow and to uh, nurture uh, this ability is the responsibilities of the universities. Now, universities in Hong Kong should also encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. So these two areas of uh, creativity is very important to the country. Now, what do you mean? What do, what do, do we mean by technological uh, innovation? For example, uh, uh, without uh, you know uh, driverless uh, driving is a technological innovation. However, um, the uh, car sharing is another type of creativity. So, uh, driverless cars would soon be uh, practiced in Shenzhen, I believe. Now. I also like to talk about state-owned enterprises. And while I, you know, while China Everbright is a listed company in Hong Kong, it is also an SOE. Now, SOE is a very important characteristics of the so-called socialist um, economy. So, SOE's status cannot be uh, endangered. Now, it is very clear that SOE is, is a very important base. Uh, both politically and economically for China. Uh, it is the very basis of the governance of the country. And it is also a very important source of talented people. So three points actually speaks for the status of the SOEs in China. It is, they are bigger, they need to be bigger, stronger and better. And there are high requirements for these SOEs. The SOE must be uh, grown or nurtured into, a, you know, into ones that have global um, competitiveness. 
And it is also uh, the requirement of SOE members to be loyal, transparent, and responsible. So these are the requirements of them. We are saying that SOEs, does it mean, uh, we emphasize on SOEs, does it mean that private enterprises are not important? No, they are very important. Uh, we are talking about mixed um, ownership and the you know they have to be the pilots of uh, the various reforms it so SOE one must work the market and then it must also uh, support the policies of uh, of the Chinese government uh, in China many things are not yes or no usually it's maybe so many a time when you find difficulties in China you will find that the Chinese government would join these different thoughts. You know, they would join private and public. They would combine um, the administrative as well as the market forces. Well, having you know done well, it create uh, great results. But done not well, it's of course disastrous. Now. Uh, ecological process now for China. This is a hugely important concept. We, I think there are three so-called China concepts. One is the Belt and Road. The other one, um, ecological uh, wisdom, and uh, thirdly, the um, human community of common destiny. Now, in many different occasions, this has been re-emphasized by the Chinese leaders ecological uh, civilization, you know, after so many decades of uh, uh, very stringent, uh, very bad pollution, this has become a very key thing for China. Now, for ecological um, uh, strategies, um, protection is the front and foremost um, thing for China. Let's say the Yangtze Economic Belt, its strategy is is to avoid, um, the guideline is to avoid, uh, you know, a big elephants so or humongous projects and also to protect the environment. This is the guiding thought for the Yangtze River Delta development, which is hugely different from previous policies. So Mr. C has, uh, has a very vivid description. It, you know, he, he talks about green mountains clear um, water would be your golden mountains and golden sea. So China emphasizes green development, green China, green belt and road, and green world. So if we're talking about a human community of common destiny, the first thing that we need to build is the human community of ecology. Now from here, we can say we can see that now this is um, statistics on a global basis as we can see many countries prioritize uh, if they put together environment and economy many countries uh, choose people uh, sixty percent of the countries chooses prioritization over environment over the economy. But you will find that Japan, including the USA, the recognition of uh, environmental prioritization is still not high. That's because their environment, their environment is uh, already quite good. So they did not choose to protect it as a priority. And also Belt and Road. Belt and Road is very important. There are 65 countries along the Belt and Road. Um, 40, uh, 63 of the global's population and a huge chunk of the global economy. Now, the GDP of Hong Kong equals, equals to the uh, aggregate of the 64 countries and its um, per capita GDP are double that of the uh, countries along that route. So China plays a very important role in Belt and Road. It also has a responsibility. As you can see, there are faster development along the Belt and Road. There's the AIIB and there is uh, the Beijing 
uh, Belt and Road Summit, and there's also a Shanghai. Uh, there are also meetings in Shanghai, in Xiamen, and in other cities in China. Uh, for Belt and Road, maybe there are challenges. No, undoubtedly, there would be some, and these would include uh, national, corporate level challenges. For example, political, economic. And um, you know other types of risk is, exist in the past decade. Well, Belt and Road, uh, um, those Belt and Road countries that has uh, two changes of leadership, you know, composes of forty percent. Uh, in Thailand, there had been six change, uh, seven changes. Uh, it it's uh, Italy five times, and also a lot of um, other changes in Nepal and other countries. Now, Chinese. Um, MNA has also caused people to fear about China. Use administration to force uh, the stopping of MNA uh, from Chinese companies in their countries. Now, if we look at the industry side, there are a lot of risks too. For example, regional, uh, I mean, religional and um, and cultural risks. Now, in some. Uh, countries, uh, the uh, holiday, the number of holidays in the year is 125. In some other countries, it's 180. You know, um, so that is uh, quite a bit of a difference. Now, I, <laughs> I just now said that Ch I, the China ever bright story has is just um, um, you know several years, but we are already in Poland and in Vietnam. You know, our experiences are still very green. Um, so I dare not share a lot about that, but I can say that there are challenges as well as opportunities. Last but not least, Hong Kong. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Miss Carrie Lam, ha in her policy report, has also indicated that Hong Kong faces both opportunities and challenges. Uh, cha uh, opportunities, the you know there are two Belt and Road as well as the uh, Guangdong, uh, Hong Kong, Macau, the Big Bay area. She has indicated that Hong Kong must use well the support that the uh, mainland government has on Hong Kong. And she also talked about how Hong Kong should uh, promote innovation and uh, development. Now, for Belt and Road, Hong Kong is a very important platform. It, it's a professional services. It's um, the first mover advantage in opening. And it's um, the caliber of its people and the position of uh, Hong Kong. They are all, you know, major uh, advantages. But no advantages is exclusive. You know, with you know, without, um, you know, w without uh, the right measures, these advantages would be taken over. Say from Shenzhen, from Shanghai, and also from Singapore. You know, these are substitutes that Hong Kong must fight against or must guard itself from. Now, Hong Kong has to build four platforms. One would be the conference platforms. Uh, conferences and, you know, you know, is, is, I know, is a very important strength for Hong Kong, at least, you know, about the Belt and Road uh, in, you know, in, in terms of exhibitions and investments. And in other, you know, things about Belt and Road, you know, Hong Kong has a lot to do about this. And Hong Kong also has to build an investment and financing platform and also a professional service platform and also a talent pool. Now, Hong Kong, I think uh, there are several things that Hong Kong has to improve for you know, the uh, understanding and study of China's strategies. This is something that Hong Kong has to work on. And also, a deeper understanding of the industries and companies in mainland is also to be worked on. And also, for the, uh, un uh, uh, the understanding of the Belt and Road partners, you know, Hong Kong needs to um, improve itself. You know, Hong Kong uh, is accustomed to the rules and the ways of doing things from developed countries. Now, as for the developing countries, Hong Kong people might not be, you know, might not know so much as well, you know, as when compared to people from Wenzhou or other parts of China. Now, and I also believe that Hong Kong needs to work on its talent. Now, with Big Bay, with the Greater Bay, uh, as you can see, we can already see that this 
concept, you know, uh, its advantages are already uh, being seen. Now, versus the various uh, Bay economy, there are actually two things that we see. One is our uh, per capita GDP is uh, lower. This is potential. And the uh, contribution of our service industry is also lower. So these are the rooms for improvement and for increase and advancement uh, for the region. I believe Hong Kong should be uh, two major supports for, uh, is one of the two important uh, supports of the greater concept. The other one would be Shenzhen. So this Bay Area is China, is also a uh, Bay economy of the world. The world has to come to this great Bay Area, and so, and so is the reverse. This is great expectations for us. And regarding innovation, Hong Kong, I believe, as an innovation, Hong Kong has just started. And it is still probing around. Now let's compare Shenzhen and Hong Kong. This is very evident, you know, I mean the difference. Shenzhen R&D investment takes up 3.2% of uh, the GDP, whereas Hong Kong is only 0.7%. And the investment is only, only from universities. And whereas Shenzhen, these investments is from the industries. And in 1,000 people in Shenzhen, there are 17 uh, technology experts. In Hong Kong, there are only two. And in Singapore, there are eight. Now, um, therefore, the attraction of uh, Shenzhen to venture capital is uh, 15 billion, which is the total of Singapore plus Hong Kong. So Hong Kong, in order to develop into a innovation center and high tech center, a lot of work needs still needs to be done. First of all, there needs to be, uh, you know, an innovation culture. You know, uh, venture capitalist uh, culture, you know, cannot you know, be used along to develop this. And I think, you know, to um, forego innovation because of money, that is hugely shame, shameful. And I think leadership is key. The third is we need to uh, build uh, creative or innovative people and businesses. Hong, Hong Kong is a very good Hong Kong science park. You know, Hong Kong has excellent universities. We think that part, some of the uh, academia needs to move closer to the industry. I believe that Hong Kong has to learn from Shenzhen and cooperate with Shenzhen. Now, with innovation, uh, Hong Kong <coughs> say, uh, Hong Kong entrepreneur says, uh, Shenzhen is the um, uh, uh, the horizon for you know is the is the paradise for innovators is the Silicon uh, Valley for China. Uh, however, Hong Kong has grown from a fish a small fishing uh, village into a, glo a global cosmopolitan. So the two uh, should complement each other. And Hong Kong, uh, you know, working in this way. Uh, should also have a very bright future. So uh, China Everbright, um, you know, th uh, some three decades ago was set up in Hong Kong. So we were born in Hong Kong, rooted. Uh, however, we are rooted in the mainland and we face the world. So we hope to be uh, the leading company in um, environmental protection for the world. So our uh, good wishes for Hong Kong is from our heart, and our expectations for Hong Kong is excellent. Uh, we are deep. We, you know, is, this is heartfelt. Just like Mr. Uh, Ms. Karen Lam has said, Hong Kong spirit is still there. Hong Kong people is still good. We need to work hard. We need to fight the challenges. We need to be confident. We need to see our own values. We need to. Uh, love and appreciate Hong Kong. So we bless Hong Kong for a better future. Thank you.